Okay, hello YouTube. Today I want to talk about how to meet the disrespect openings. So basically you play e4 and your opponent says, hey, I'm going to play h5, or I'm going to play e6 and d6 and shuffle my king and queen around, or I'm just going to move my knight back and forth for six or seven moves, and then I'm just going to play chess from there. Because I'm so much of a better player than you that I can crush you anyway, even if I'm down like six or seven tempo. So how do we crush this? How do we punish this so that people don't do this to us anymore? And we say, okay, look, you picked the wrong guy to play this idea against because I know what I'm doing and I know how to crush this. And more importantly, I know how not to go wrong and I know not how to end up worse. So anyways, if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So let's start with you play e4 and they play something like h5. Now, as you can see, I have the engine up here, and I'm going to have the engine running throughout this video so you can see the objective assessment while I'm giving you kind of the subjective assessment, while I'm giving you the ideas and the themes and what's going on and how those themes translate to this concrete assessment. Now, right now, white has an advantage. Uh, as you can see, the engine is saying white is better by plus 1.5. Okay, so what should white do? White should, of course, just put both pawns in the middle of the board. This is what your chess coach told you to do. This is actually very correct. Uh, for the first two moves, we can just follow very basic principled advice. We can put both of our pawns in the middle of the board, and we have an advantage because we have more space in the middle, and it's easier to develop our pieces, and black has lost a tempo by playing pawn to h5. It's on the next move that we need to understand chess a little bit better to make sure that we don't go wrong. Let's say that black plays something like c6 here. Black is preparing to strike back in the middle of the board. Now we can see that the objective assessment of the position is still quite high. You know, white has a big advantage with a whole number of moves, like knight c3, knight d2, bishop d3, knight f3, c4, are all still a pawn and a half advantage for white. Now my personal favorite is knight c3. I'm going to come back to this in a minute and explain why. Uh, but let's talk about a move that we could make here that would actually be very bad that looks good on a beginner understanding of chest where we just put our pawns in the middle of the board and we should be better right is this move pawn to f4 so let's say we play pawn to f4 here this move is actually a mistake and it's a pretty big one you saw the objective assessment drop quite a bit we went from a pawn and a half as you can see to 0.3 pawn advantage for white how did our assessment drop so far and more importantly, why did it drop so far? Why is f4 such a huge mistake? Well, the point is, is black is going to strike back in the middle with d5. Now, when black strikes back in the middle of the board, you can see that he's not down a whole ton of tempo here. Uh, each side has moved three pawns. Nobody's developed pieces yet. So the development lead that white has on a dynamic level is not very huge. Okay, now white does have a little bit of its base advantage. And white does have a slightly easier time developing his pieces, and that is translated into this assessment of very slight edge white. As you can see, it's about like plus 0 0.29 pawns or something like that. Very, very slight edge white because of the slightly easier position to develop. Now, even moving forward here, even just maintaining this very, very slight edge requires a little bit of understanding of what's going on. You need to play a move like knight c3 and maintain this tension and keep the position open. Because as soon as you close the position, your entire advantage goes away. So if you play a move like e5, you just lost your whole advantage. It went from plus 0.3 to equality. Why did you lose your whole advantage? Well, you lost your whole advantage because now the position is close. So now the tempos don't matter. The fact that you were up this half a tempo when he played move pawn to h5 and you moved center pawns doesn't matter anymore because the position is closed. So now it's just a positional assessment of what's going on. And what is going on positionally? Well, positionally, white has a little bit more space, so that's a good thing. That's a plus in white's column. Well, white has a little bit more space in the middle of the board. White has a pawn on e5, and you know black doesn't have a pawn on white's side of the position. That's good. But white has a bad bishop. The dark squared bishop is a bad bishop. It's hitting its own pawns, whereas black is going to be able to get rid of its bad bishop. So, for example, black can play bishop g4 right away. Now, it's really easy to go from equality to significantly worse in just another couple of natural-looking moves. Like, for, for example, we should just play knight f3 here, and we're still you know, very, very slightly better. Um, you know, black has gotten rid of his bad bishop. That's not good for us, but we still have more space. That is good for us. So we should still be a little bit better. Like, our, our, our space should be worth a little bit more than the fact that black doesn't have any bad pieces. So after e6, uh, you know, the position is equal but we can lose our whole advantage we can lose our we can lose equality and go to a slight disadvantage if we just play one more natural looking over natural looking to a lot of players 
if we develop our knight, like knight c3, after c5, it's advantage black. And that's advantage black objectively. That's advantage black according to the engine. Now it's like plus, you know, 0 0.3, you know, 0 0.5, you know, maybe a half a pawn better for black. Why? What's going on here? How did this go so wrong? Well, again, tempos for the most part in a closed position, they don't matter. So what are we looking at? We're looking at structure. White still has a little bit more space. White has more space in the middle of the board. White still has the bad piece. The bishop is bad. Uh, but now black is going to have two central pawns to white's one. So he's going to have an E and a D pawn, and white is only going to have an E pawn. So basically black is going to have the F, E, and D pawn, and that's going to be worth more than the E, F, and C pawn. Black has a better center. So even though white has a little bit more space in the center, black's center is overall objectively better, and that translates into slight edge black. Okay, so we know what went wrong. So we can already sort of establish a little bit of a rule here. So like e4, h5, d4, and then say c6. What's the rule? Well, we don't want to meet d5 with e5, okay? And we certainly don't want to play f4 and then meet d5 with e5. So after c6, we should be playing a move like knight to c3 in this position. And then after d5, what are we going to do? Well, we're not going to play e5. Because if we play e5 and we close this position off, our development lead, our tempos don't matter, and then it's just measuring up the positional advantages within the position, we should still be like maybe a little, little tiny bit better, you know, if we play e5 because we still have more space. Um, you know, he has a, a, a bishop, but it's not clear that he can get rid of it in that case. It, it does look a little bit better for us because it's not clear that he can get rid of that bad bishop. But what is like kind of the objectively best move in this position? Well, the objectively best moves are moves like bishop d3 and knight f3. I personally don't play those moves because both of those moves actually sacrifice a pawn. Usually when I get a position like this, I'll play a move like h3. Why am I playing h3? Because I know that I have an advantage after h3 and I sacrifice no material. So for example, after h3 and then say d takes e4, knight takes e4, I have a great position in the middle of the board. It's basically a Carol Khan where black has thrown in this move pawn to h5, and he's managed to weaken his g6 and g5 squares, which can only favor me. And I have an open position and I have more development. I have to be better. And this, of course, translates to the assessment that the computer's giving of plus nearly a whole pawn for white. But the computer doesn't like this. The computer thinks it's better to just develop a piece. Why does the computer just want to develop a piece? Because the computer actually wants to sacrifice a pawn. Uh, the computer understands that its advantage is that it's an open position and black has wasted a move on h5. So if the position remains open, even if we give up a pawn, we should have a huge advantage. So the computer wants to play something like, say, bishop d3, and then say d takes e4, knight takes e4, and then if queen takes e4, it just wants to gain a tempo, knight f3, queen b6, and then just develop something like queen e2. And you can see here the computer is saying white is better by plus close to three pawns. It's like two and a half pawns and climbing. You know, the more the engine runs, the more it loves it. Uh, white is actually down a pawn in this position. You know, so white's down a pawn, but white should have nearly a decisive development and attacking lead. So this is kind of like, this is where it's really valuable to understand, like, your Morphe games. You know, if you've looked at a lot of Morphe games and you've seen how he's handled open positions and huge development leads for a pawn, this is where that comes into play. You can see the objective assessment is really, really high. You know, it's it's more than enough compensation for a pawn. It's it's enough compensation. You know, you've lost a pawn and you, you've basically got four pawns worth of compensation for it. It's a ridiculous amount of compensation. So... This is objectively the best way to play it, but if you're, again, if you're not comfortable with sacrificing a pawn, knight c3, d5, h3, we can just declare, hey, we've got a slight edge. We're not giving up a pawn, and we have a slight edge. We're going to maintain this tension. We're not going to meet d5 with e5. So what about, like, the other disrespect openings? Like, just understanding that you don't want to meet d5 with e5 is really critical. So, like, understanding, like, for example, after e4 and let's say e6 and then d4, d6, so they just kind of hang out with their two pawns on e6 and d6 and they don't want to do anything. Just kind of understanding that you don't want this pawn structure change with e5 and d5 to happen because then whatever tempo you gained by whatever disrespect opening they played is going to be negated by the fact that they closed the position. So, for example, knight c3, g6, f4. Here, f4 is totally fine, right? But what's really important is if they play d5, we can't play e5. So what do we do? Well, we need to hold the, the, the e4 square and just develop and maintain the tension. And this is where I think weaker players have a hard time because they really have a hard time with maintaining tension. 
They don't like it when the pawns are facing each other like this, and they can capture each other at any moment. They hate that. Um, strong players will maintain tension forever, if necessary. Uh, I will personally maintain the tension till the end of time if I think that white has an advantage by doing so. So here you should just maintain the tension. Just play something like bishop d3. And if they relieve the tension, you know, with something like d takes e4 and you play knight takes e4, note that here, you know, queen takes d4 isn't even possible because if queen takes d4, we would have just bishop b5 check winning the queen. Uh, you would just have a huge advantage. Like knight c6, pawn to c3. You have this development lead. The position is open. And this translates to a decisive advantage for white. You can see that reflected in this engine assessment, plus 1.7 pawns for white. Okay, so by maintaining this open structure, you're not worried about d5 as long as you maintain that tension between e4 and d5. Everything should be fine. Okay, so you're not going to meet d5 with e5. You're going to meet d5 by maintaining that tension. But more importantly, you're going to be leery about playing e5 yourself. So like if, for example, after f4, they play bishop g7, we need to be very careful about when and how we play e5. So like we'll play knight f3, knight e7. Should we play e5 here? You know, if we play e5 here, they're going to close things up. If we play e5, they're going to play, uh, if we play e5, they're going to play d5. So we should play something like bishop d3. But let's take a look. e5, d5. Okay. Now, objectively, we're actually still doing pretty good. Like, according to the engine, we still have an advantage. So the question is, why, why do we have an advantage here, but we didn't have an advantage in the other situations where we played e5, d5? Well, the computer thinks that we objectively have an advantage because we can play bishop e3, bishop f2, bishop h4. That's basically what it's saying, is that we have enough of a development lead where, where black can't get off the ground, so white should have some sort of advantage by basically maneuvering this bishop. Bishop e3, bishop f2, bishop, bishop h4. But, believe it or not, this advantage of plus 1.5 at this point in the game isn't as big of the advantage that we could have gotten if we would have maintained the tension or kept the position open. So if we hadn't played e5 we could actually start maneuvering towards an even bigger advantage down the road. So what we should do here is we should maintain this position. We should play something like bishop d3 and just develop. And then say b6, bishop e3, just develop, bishop b7, queen d2, just develop, cat knight d7, castles queen side, just develop, and then say castles king side, right? So now everybody's just kind of hung back and done nothing. Nobody's played e5 and allowed d5. Nobody's played... Uh, d5, and then white made the mistake of playing e5. What do we do here? Well, once you've done all this, once you've castled, put your pieces in the middle, connected your rooks, you need to understand that just developing your pieces, castling, and putting your pieces in the middle, once you've done it all, then we're moving on to the next phase of the game. You know, we're moving on to the middle game. Now, what should we do here? Uh, one of my best pieces of advice is once you've castled, just take your age pawn or your A pawn, and just chuck it up the board. And I know you're thinking, that doesn't this go against basic principle? No, no, it doesn't, right? Because it's not the opening anymore. You know, this is the middle game. Once you reach the middle game, H4 absolutely follows the basic principles of chess. And let me try to explain why. So when you play H4, you are absolutely following the basic principles of chess. Why? Because every single piece in your position is developed but your rooks. How do rooks develop? Rooks don't develop by moving out. And this is, again, a mistake that a lot of beginners make. When they develop their rooks or they try to develop their rooks, the beginner way to develop your rook is to play like h4, rook h3, rook g3, and then they develop the rook that way. And, of course, that's ridiculously dumb, and it wastes tons of time, and it usually puts the rook in a situation where the rook can get captured or attacked or whatever. Rooks don't develop that way. The way rooks develop is rooks get open files. That's basically where a pawn exchanges itself for another pawn, and then the rook is sitting on an open file. A rook can develop without moving at all. So a rook on h1 can actually develop by simply pushing the pawn in front of it until that pawn gets exchanged, and then that rook is developed. So now that we've developed all of our other pieces, our knights, our bishops, our queen, we've gotten our king to safety, we have to develop our last piece. We have to develop our rooks. How do we develop our rooks? We develop our rooks by creating some sort of central tension so that we can create an exchange. In this position, there's really only two ways to do it without making our position significantly worse. Like if we play e5 and they play d5, that's bad for us. Okay, so basically we either need to play h4, h5, or we need to play something like g4 and f5. And we can open the position for our rooks one of those two ways. 
But the one that weakens our position the least, the one that's the safest move to play, is h4. These rook pawn thrusts are almost always the safest idea in the position in the middle game. Because when you push an h pawn, it only weakens one file. It weakens the file next to it. So when you push an h pawn, it only weakens the g file. But when you push a g pawn, it weakens both the f file and the h file. Or when you push the b pawn, it weakens both the a file and the c file. So one of the best pieces of advice is if you don't know what else to do in a position once you've put all your pieces in the middle and once you've castled, just push the rook pawn on whichever side you're not castled and gain a little bit of space and then try to figure out what to do after that. So in this case, like if you play h4 and they say, ah, I see your plan, you want to play h5 and hg and open up your rook file and get a huge attack basically for nothing. And they say, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to play h5. You might be asking, well, should I just play e5 here and gain space in the middle? And again, if you play e5 here, you're actually giving away most of your advantage, if not all of your advantage. And I know it's shocking. Like, you've built up a huge advantage here. The computer's giving, like, plus, you know, 2.7. It's almost plus 3. How can I give away the majority of my advantage with a move like e5? Let's take a look. We play e5, right? What happens? e5. They're going to take on f3, gf3, and then they're going to play b5. And they're going to attack your king. It's actually very difficult for you to break through over here, but they're going to start opening lines over here. The computer gives this as unclear. You know, it's, it's basically, you went from 1.7 to plus 0 0.4. The computer's saying you, you essentially have almost no advantage at all if you still do have an advantage. So this position just went from decisive advantage white to completely unclear with one move, just with this pawn thrust, with this move pawn to e5. So what do we do instead of pawn to e5? Well, after h5, we should just continue opening the position for our rooks. We should play g4. Sacrifice that pawn. Now after hg4, we just play knight g5. And here's the plan. We're going to play h5. We're going to play hg6. We're going to play queen h2. And we're going to threaten mate. You know, we're threatening to get checkmate on h7. Now, according to the computer, this plan is basically unstoppable. You know, according to the engine, we're already like plus three and... Black should not have a very good way to defend against this very basic plan of just playing h5, hg6, queen h2, queen h7. And that's because white has more space, and white has two more pieces developed than black. Basically, white's rooks are now in the game. Black's rooks are doing nothing. Black's rooks are sitting behind its pawns. So white is up 10 points of material and attacking with them because he has the space to make that attack happen. And that's how you crush these do-nothing systems. You make sure that you don't meet d5 with e5. You make sure that you don't play an early e5 and allow d5, because as soon as you close the position, any development leads you have is completely diminished. And instead, what you do is you build your position up in the middle of the board, and then if nothing has happened in the center, you just play h4, h5, and you just start gaining some space on whichever side you happen not to be castled on. And that's how you crush uh, these setups, and that's how you get a huge advantage. And that's basically how to play chess. It's just understanding what to do, but more importantly, understanding what not to do to lose your advantage, to lose your development lead, to lose those tempos that you gained in the early opening. Okay, so anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.